So that brings us to uh, Cloward and Olin. Um, once again, they're working with the same uh, theoretical perspective that Durkheim laid down for us. Um, Cloward was certainly a student of Merton, <clears throat> so he's uh, uh, is trying to incorporate Merton's strain theories into uh, his understanding of what uh, they're both looking at in their own research. And so they're tackling a piece of what uh, Merton was getting at, and that is this idea of legitimate versus illegitimate means of retaining, obtaining wealth. Um, they're saying that you cannot assume illegitimate means are always available. Um, this is the, and then they give a really good example of um, drug dealing, and we all live in Colorado, and and the laws have been changing over uh, the last eight or nine years or actually 10, 20 years in this state. And uh, it never amazes me when people say, well, I'm just going to move to Colorado and I'm going to start growing marijuana and I'm going to start selling it. And um, well, there's an assumption there that I think is not always a good assumption, and that is that you know how to do any of those things, that you have a market or um, uh, a means to uh, make money doing these illegal or illegitimate uh, forms of employment. And so uh, it's assumed that it's available, it's assumed that it's easy. But when it all plays out, it might not be as easy as you thought. Uh, understanding the motivations and availability of opportunities to learn about and participate in deviance. Um, as I mentioned, they're not always there, even if you think they should be. Um, uh, these two, Cloward and Nolan, are also dealing with the idea that behaviors and deviant uh, deviants are learned. Um, uh, this is where Olin comes in, who is a student of Edwin Sutherland and um, very much familiar with uh, the idea of differential association. And, and they're also saying that not everyone has equal opportunities to learn skills and types of deviancy. Uh, just because you want to be a gangbanger doesn't mean that you can and doesn't mean that you know how to when it all comes down to it. As I mentioned, these two theorists, oh, um, uh, Cloward being a, a student of Merton and Olin being a student of Sutherland, come up with what they call a differential opportunity theory. Um, once again, they're looking at criminal subcultures and their characteristics. Um, uh, criminal subcultures are usually lower class, adolescent boys with open, illegitimate opportunity structures. Um, we see this in the old neighborhoods where organized crime took place. They were very systematic. Within the neighborhoods themselves, um, you didn't find a lot of violence. And this organized structure ultimately is put into place to avoid attention. And what they understood was that violence and chaos draws attention. And that is certainly bad for those that are uh, working on the outskirts of the social norms and maybe engaging in illegal. Um, uh, actions. They're also looking at the perpetuation of crime through generations. They understand that successful criminals become an icon or a, rem or a role model for the neighborhood and um, uh, it's what every, it's, it, it's the celebrity figure that everybody looks up to in the neighborhood. Um, of course these uh, these icons 
are very, very impressionable on the youth. The youth look up to um, their elders and they strive to be like them or to be better than them. And they ultimately imitate and learn skills and norms of criminal behavior, um, which allows them to become the future icons of the neighborhood. Um, once again, we're looking at lower class adolescents and what we're finding in differential opportunity theory um, is the neighborhoods are socially disorganized and unstructured, uh, which is very unlike the, um, the mob neighborhoods that we find in the 19... 30s, 40s, and 50s. They take the role more of the retreatist subcultures. Um, what we find in these types of subcultures is, is what are referred to as double failures. And uh, that means that they cannot find legitimate or illegitimate means to uh, illustrating their success in society. And uh, these groups ultimately, these retreatist groups ultimately um, retreat to things like drugs um, as, as a result of the inability to fit in anywhere else. Uh, Robert Agnew also gives us um, his general strain theory. Um, uh, this is providing what uh, the authors and, and many in the field felt was a fresh perspective on strain theories. And he was ultimately challenging conflict and labeling theories with his, his new ideas on strain theory. Um, the assumptions were circumstances led to deviant behavior and um and people were pressured into crime and he felt that uh within this pressure group the relations the relationships with other people uh may may ultimately create the strain that drives individuals to be deviant he felt there were three types of negative relations the first was to prevent or threaten to prevent achievement of some value goals. Um, another was to remove or threaten to remove a positive stimuli, uh, and then present uh, or present or threaten to present a negative stimuli. Um, Agnew's theory, uh, of course, you have the strain. With leads, which leads to anger and frustration, which ultimately leads to negative or deviant behavior. Um, the strain could be something uh, as simple as uh, you watch TV, you you see what making it it is in your society is, but you live in an inner city, inner city or in, in an inner city neighborhood, and there's very little opportunity for you to uh, legitimately make it. So. Uh, you become angered, you become frustrated, and and then you ultimately join a gang and engage in some deviant behavior. Um, so you can see how it all plays out. Um, uh, there were certain types of strain that are most likely to lead to deviant behavior and or crime, according to Agnew. Um, anything with high amounts of strain uh, strain that is perceived as unjust, uh, strain associated with low self-control, um, strain creates more pressure or incentive for criminal coping. Um, uh, many youth groups, many individuals engaged in, uh, in life in and of itself uh, could fall into these categories, but uh, it's certainly uh, easy to see how uh, young people of color who are running into structural impediments in society could certainly 
uh, see many of these strains in in their own lives and um, it doesn't take too much of a, a genius to figure out how they might engage in deviant behavior. Mesner and Rosenfield uh, bring anomie to the institutional level. Uh, once again, they're, they're getting at what is deemed the American dream. Um, and in the American dream, it fosters an idea that anything goes when you're pursuing these personal goals. Um, uh, these theorists identify the values underlying the American dream. Achievement, which is connected to personal worth. Um, individualism, everyone should find a way to make it. Uh, a, a universalism, which is an, encour an encouragement of all to aspire to success and wealth attainment. And then, of course, the underlying uh, value is uh, materialism, and that is money is the main way to measure success and wealth in American culture. Um, if you don't make any money, you're not making it in society. At least those are the social norms related to the American dream. And you can imagine how that's going to create strain on individuals um, who are not able to make as much money as uh, it seems like everyone else is. And it might drive them to engage in deviant behavior to pick up that slack. Um, and of course, this suggests that the American dream leads to crime and deviance because of its emphasis on monetary success. Um, once again, this is not rocket science, folks. If, if you are judged by how much money you have and you don't have a whole lot of money, um, you're going to do things to find a ways to get money. Some criticisms of anomie and strain theories. Um, one, it's difficult, if not impossible, to measure how whole societies focus on particular goals and means. I'm not sure that that's what uh, these theorists were really trying to do, but okay, I get it. Um, it assumes that a value consensus, consensus exists across society. Um, i.e. the goal that monetary success is held above all. Um, and it's, it's assuming that values are universal um, where other goals might be valued more. Um, this is an assumption. Um, and once again, I think that um, when we talk about structures of society, we assume that everyone shares those values, but that's not always true. And um, some resist the uh, values and norms placed out by, by the social norms. Um, and uh, they, they go a different way. But most people fall in line with uh, materialism and see their success based on money. That might be changing with the new, newer generations, but historically that's where we've been for some time. Um, uh, they, they argue that there's a class bias. It's difficult to account for deviance among the privileged classes when you're using anomie or um, uh, strain theories. Um, they're also arguing that more equal opportunity offers a realistic solution to crime and deviance in the U.S. Um, and that this is not the answer. So, um, and then of course, uh, they, they pick with Merton over uh, the idea that he never precisely defined what anomie was. Um, the book always takes us to the street when it's talking about uh, the topics in, in the, the book itself. And uh, in this particular chapter, it's, it takes us to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, uh, this is a movement that uh, you might not think uh, makes a, a whole lot of sense on the surface. Um, uh, this was populated by a lot of young, highly educated individuals. Um, these individuals realized that as at, that education uh, was no longer a guarantee to success. 
and they didn't find 